What is art and who gets to decide? That is ultimately the question being asked in the street art game today. There's this thin gray line between art and vandalism and that line is mostly the product of stale, outdated laws and currents of misunderstanding. Now, I'm a professional artist, um, known mostly for painting large portraits and figurative work. I just had two best years of my career, two big solo shows. I was doing a bunch of group shows. I was working on a series of paintings about the realities of breast cancer. By all means, I was very, very busy. As much as I consider myself an artist, though, I also consider myself an activist. In the 80s, when I was a young punker, I was not fascinated with the art of Keith Haring at all. But after 20 years, I raised a bunch of kids, life experiences, formed some mature political opinions, and uh, now his art strikes me as some of the most truthful, hard-hitting political art that I can find. So I, I kind of became obsessed with the power of his message. I really touched base with his white guilt, um, had mad respect for his roots in the American street art movement, his advocacy for equal rights, and his art for the masses philosophy. They were all hitting with me. At the same, at the same time that I was kind of rediscovering all this about Keith Haring, my, my hometown, Jacksonville, was on the national stage for failing to pass an equal rights ordinance that would have protected LGBT people in the workplace. They also failed to convict in the Trayvon Martin case. And the first trial for Michael Dunn for murdering Jordan Davis was fast approaching. Racial tensions were high. And so was this issue of inequality. Now you couple these with the fact that Jacksonville had never really been a city that historically grasped visual arts in a big way. The activist side of me saw an opportunity to protest all of these issues at once. So I used Keith Haring's art to keep the message pure, anonymous, and beautiful. And I went out and I started painting these images, Keith Haring tribute images, onto uh, public traffic signal boxes that are at, like every stoplight, basically. There's silver boxes, they're postered, stickered, they're tagged, painted over, they've been scraped, you know, the whole nine yards, but it's, they look like trash. <clears throat> so I kind of picked out like what, what the best ones in the city were and I started painting these images on there. And I painted images of equality, people holding up hearts, people hugging. Um, this one where a heart makes like a knot uh, and goes into two bodies. Uh, Anti-war images. And then I changed some of Keith's images too to meet copyright law. And then I, I changed one of the designs pretty substantially. It was a design that he did with two people worshiping a cross in an open field. And I juxtaposed the cross with an assault weapon. And I put the, the worshipers in a pile of dead people. And um, it was right after a school shooting. It seemed kind of urgently important. It was on the highest traffic count box I could find in the city. And it was like, you know, like a half a million people a month would hopefully do that, that box. And after about six weeks, it came down, and I started hearing immediately thereafter that the police were looking for Keith's whereabouts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after months of unsuccessful police work, um, <laughs> the police subpoena Facebook. Facebook gives them a bunch of information. They go to Comcast. They track it to me. They asked me to turn myself in through third parties, and it seems, it seems crazy to me that I'm being hunted and wanted for felonies for painting pieces of art that actually really reside in museums all around the world. You know, I kind of thought it would trump the issue of art versus vandalism. But uh, 
it didn't. So I gambled and I went to the press in disguise and I gave a whole bunch of interviews. When I was on TV and the radio, they disguised my voice also. And I talked about what I did and why I did it. And I asked the city's forgiveness, but I also asked them to take up this issue of street art and hopefully to protect my anonymity. But again, the sheriff wasn't having that. <laughs> um, about that time, a friend introduced me to John Phillips. That was Jordan Davis's attorney, or his family's attorney. And we met and we hit it off and immediately he gave me a full legal team that understood my needs, you know, uh, that kind of understood what I was doing. While we were trying to work stuff out, I was living on the lam for about eight weeks. I was staying at my studio, friends' houses, and uh, I slipped up, my back was really hurting, and spent a few nights at home in early March. And at nine o'clock in the morning, the most obnoxious banging on my door prompts me to jump up, tiptoe through my house as fast as I can, and I run out the back door in just my underwear and a pair of Vans. <laughs> and about three steps up, I look, and there's just cops everywhere. There's like 15 of them, they're all armed, and they grab me, and they pull me aside and cuff me, and then they throw me into a car, and uh, they go in and like raid my house, and push all my family out. They, take like my phone, all my art supplies, uh, all the equipment that I had had around uh, drawing sketches, every stitch of clothing that I wore in the interviews where I was in disguise, <laughs> that's actually what was on the warrant. That's what they really were after. So they arrest me, they take me, ask me a bunch of questions for like three hours and uh, tell me how much they are really like me. The police boast about my arrest the next morning as if I was like a serial rapist or murderer. I mean, these guys were so proud. It was all over the place. Um, my anonymity was gone. Uh, the, I posted bail early the next morning and I was on the front page of the paper above a national story about a terrorist. It was pretty crazy. Um, then, I. I, uh, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm, I go to my house, I, pu I pull onto my street, there's a 40 foot news truck parked in front of my house. I'm shitting bricks. I drive right out of town, violate my bail, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure, you know, exactly uh, what to do. So I kind of collect my thoughts, I come back, something awesome's happened, you know. Um, after days of topping news, social media, NPR posted my story to the top of their national webpage, and there was all of a sudden this huge public backlash. I don't think the sheriff expected it. I don't think city leaders expected it. Quite honestly, I don't think anybody expected it, but it was awesome. And what it, what it made clear was is that Jacksonville was ready for some street art. You know, it was like I had tested it and it worked. Now the thing about street art, it's not really that legal, you know? In America, it's pretty much illegal everywhere. Um, there's exceptions. My favorite's in Sao Paulo, like where these artists, they secured walls in the worst neighborhoods. They got five, eight, 10 story buildings and they painted these huge, gorgeous murals on them. And then like a year later, they go back and visit the community and it's been transformed. All these young families are moving in, crime is greatly reduced, commerce and uh, cafes are opening because people are coming to see the art, and a whole new community and pride is like born out of that art. Now, think about what cities are hot in North America. Austin, Asheville, Portland, Brooklyn, Orlando, Miami, Vancouver, all these cities have had major turnarounds. They did many things during their turnaround, but one of the things that they did early, what seemed to kind of spearhead each of their revivals, was a major embracing of street art. And I don't think that's a mistake. 
You know, they, they probably embraced art more in general, but there was a major embracing of street art. Each of these communities created zones where there was big, free art that was exciting and cutting edge. That's what creates community. That's what brings people to a city to eat, shop, live, dine, party. The uh, art, that, art like that gives cities identities. This city desperately needs one. It's one of the cheapest ways to transform a landscape. And it's, it's also one of the best ways to create landmark art projects that the whole world will want to come see. Now, a couple of things to think about. Uh, well, th this will be a big game changer for Jacksonville. Um, we've, we've just introduced a law that will overwrite 18 local ordinances, codes, and laws that prevent art in our streets right now. Our downtown investment authority was pretty visionary, and they, they kind of met with me early on, and we talked about what would be awesome, and they got behind it, and threw down a lot of money, they got attorneys involved, they went and met with people on the city council, the mayor's office, the cultural council, and our chamber, and they got support pretty much all the way around. And we're shooting for a November 25th passage, so I hope that if you're in Jacksonville, you'll get involved. This will be a big game changer for us. It, it takes the boxes that I was arrested for painting and pays artists well to paint them. <laughs> it, uh, it also makes walls, public and private, legal to paint with the proper permission from either the landowner or the city. That's huge too. It also uh, is going to establish some graffiti zones where kids can go do whatever they want, whenever they want, and uh, not have to worry about the police. And it'll also take stress off some of our local businesses that have been go undergoing some of the, the graffiti and stuff. Then lastly, the artists and the people from the neighborhoods, this program will start in our downtown and the three major historic neighborhoods that are connected to it, uh, Springfield, Riverside, and San Marco. So each of those respective neighborhoods will have their citizens sitting on the approval committees with artists. So there's this organic level of buy-in. Lastly is the funding for that. Um, this, the funding, private and public right now, we'll drop over half a million dollars into our art community over the next year on street art, and that's pretty huge. Each of these things is a major accomplishment in and of themselves, but together, these are real seeds of change. Like I said, this is what brings people to cities. This is art. A couple of things to think about as you kind of leave and carry on, carry your thoughts about street art. Don't censor it, um, and don't let it be censored. Today's youth are the most cynical, most marketed to professional consumers that have ever stepped foot on the earth, and they see city-approved, benign, uh, decorative art is propaganda of the state. I think we can all agree it pretty much is. <laughs> you know, Let the art go. Let it be cutting edge, thought provoking. Let it ask questions that'll better our lives. That's what art is. And you guys get to decide. It's in your hands at this point. Just as Jacksonville can unlearn its anti-art laws, you guys can go into your communities and change things, pass art, make it happen. Thank you for your time.